Urban Cultural Studies, the podcast, interviews, and welcome to Urban Cultural Studies podcast. I am Ben Fraser, and today our guest is Matt Feinberg, who is currently a lecturer in the English department at Case Western Reserve University in Cleveland, Ohio, uh, where he teaches in the university's writing program. Matt's research studies urban space by analyzing dramatic texts, performance spaces, urban planning documents, and urban social movements as a way to explore the intersection of literary studies and cultural geography. Welcome to the program, Matt. It's great to have you here. Thanks so much, Ben. I appreciate the opportunity that you're giving me to discuss my work today. I've just read your article. It's titled, uh, From Cigarreras to Indignados, Spectacles of Scale in the CSA La Tabacalera of Lavapiés, Madrid. And we're going to talk about those mm -hmm. uh, initials. And you're dealing with a very expansive time frame from the 19th century through the 20th and on to the 21st. You're looking at a specific neighborhood in Madrid at the legacy of certain typical cultural forms and also at the persistence of socioeconomic problems mm -hmm. there. But I want to start with something referenced by your title that forms, I think, the center of your discussions, which range from dance, theater, music and performance to urban change and urban protests. Let's start with what you call cigarrera culture. Who was, who is the cigarrera? You know, I think it's a really good place to begin because I think in many ways this, this really iconic figure uh, encapsulates the layers of space and time I'm working on in the article. Mm -hmm. In most basic terms, the Cigarrera refers to the women that hand-rolled cigars and cigarettes in Spain's tobacco factories from about, oh, the 17th century uh, on until the process became mechanized in the late 19th century. Yeah. So for me, what's most interesting about the Cigarrera tradition is that it's wrapped up in all these cultural circuits of meaning that are both uh, local and often national. All right. Hold on, let's spend a bit more time with what you mean there. How, how does this figure of the cigarrera, as you just put it, activate cultural circuits of meaning? Well, it, it's not only a, a cultural icon, it's also one that's connected to how we think of space. That is, it's, it's all wrapped up in, in sort of these geographic sensibilities. And in that sense, it's, it's uh, activating these cultural imaginaries. So, for example, the cigarrera is is often conflated with, with these uh, very stereotypical images of Andalusian femininity. And that's a connection that we can probably trace back to French composer George Bizet's famous opera, Carmen, from 1875. The popularity of that opera, you know, really made famous uh, this beautiful, sensuous cigarrera that worked at the Tabacalera in Seville. And, uh, and it's the same image that, that is, is, you know, was often reproduced by other Northern European romantic writers. You know, it was also found in the, the promotional strategies that were used by, by Franco in the 1960s, in which they attempted to basically export this bullfighter flamenco image of Spain. Exactly. It's an image that's really Andalusian, but it's also really associated with Spain in general. And even today, when people think of Spain, that's usually what they think of. They think of the flamenco dancer. And so in this sense, the cigarrera is, is very intertwined with, with Spain's national symbols. There are a number of books recently that have focused on this nexus of tourism, authenticity, yeah. culture, plans for economic prosperity in the Spain of the 1960s uh, under the dictatorship of Francisco Franco, Justin Crumbaugh's Destination Dictatorship from 2009, and you also have uh, the book The Mobile Nation by Tatiana Pavlovich from 2012. Right. This is a time of of increased urbanization, the 1960s. But of course, Madrid had been the destination for immigrants for quite some time, going back to the turn of the 20th century and, of course, centuries before that. Yeah, that's a good point. Um, immigration does play a big role in this, since so many of the immigrants, when we're talking about the emergence of this figure in the, the 19th century and onwards, most of these people, a lot of them were from Andalusia, and many of these women worked in Madrid's Tabacalera, in the tobacco factory. So they were, you know, they were a fixture of, of Lava Pies, which is this very traditional working class neighborhood in Madrid. And as a result, this Andalusian inflected cigarrera became one of the, the tipos or typical characters that were standard in the uh, lyric operettas of the Sarsuela that was hugely popular in the late 19th and early 20th century, but particularly Madrid. Many people think of the, the Sarsuela as this even though it was produced in other parts of Spain as a, an art form that is particularly associated with Madrid. Yeah. So it's in part because of these sarsuelas and how popular they were that people's image today 
of classic madrileños comes back to this sort of Andalusian cigarera type. Uh -huh. And so you see this actually on the street um, on festival days in Madrid on um, uh, San Isidro, which is the, the patron saint of Madrid. The women wear these costumes that, that look like that. They look very Andalusian. Um, and the men are dressed as chulapos and they wear these special hats and these special jackets and there's these costumes. And this is partly from the, the sarsuela, but it also, a lot of it is very much tied to the tabacalera and to lava pies. Right, right. So this, this image has become one of the, these classic images of, of, of castizo or authentic Madrid. So in this sense, as we said before, it was sort of a national symbol. It's also at the same time sort of wrapped up in in being a symbol of Madrid. It's interesting to see where the most seemingly authentic and national cultural icons come from. And here this brings up uh, what is a hallmark of some attempts at cultural authenticity, the co-optation of working class culture for quite a different purpose indeed. Right. There's another level to your analysis, which is to say that the cigarrera has been reappropriated Definitely. by social movements in the Lavapiés neighborhood. Why are they interested in this iconic image? Well, that's a great question. I think that in part, it's, it's merely an attempt to find sort of these kitschy images to put on flyers and leaflets that'll catch people's attention and make people smile. Yeah. Uh, at the same time, it's, it's, a, it's a lot more than that because in Madrid and in Lava Pies, the cigarera is, is, is a really complicated symbol. So in addition to these associations with castizo culture, the cigarera is also associated with uh, with industrial labor and protest movements in Madrid. So part of this is due to the fact that these cigar rollers, cigarette rollers, made up nearly 10% of the female workforce, uh, industrial workforce in Madrid in the late 19th and early 20th centuries. And so this group of workers is, you know, was unique because they not only worked in a female-dominated workplace, but they were also uh, really highly concentrated spatially in the city, with almost 90% of them or something like that, huh. living in Lava Bies and other neighborhoods south of the city center. So oftentimes this was this was in the uh, this really social environment of the corralas. And explain corralas for listeners. Oh, sure. So the corralas are these residential buildings with a central patio that are sort of surrounded by balconies that were often people shared a water source and a bathroom. And, you know, they're well known as being spaces where people live communally. So many people associate these corralas or these spaces with Lava Pies, partly because so many sarsuelas were set in Lava Pies. It's always sort of the, it's like the backdrop par excellence for the for the sarsuela. And there's always these scenes of women hanging laundry, singing about the, the men that they love and the men that are jilting them, etc. And there's some truth to this image because they indeed really did have this sort of very unique social experience, this shared social experience. Yeah. And uh, historian uh, Tema Kaplan, for example, this, she describes this as this female consciousness that came from this unique sense of community that developed from, from sharing all these daily routines, both at home, but also since many of them worked at the Tabacalera, a lot of it happened uh, at the workplace, and then as they waited to go into the building every morning, because the you know when the shift change happened, it was also in the street, oftentimes babes in arm. You know they also had a a really strong collective tendency. So these were also the first female workers to unionize, uh -huh. and they were involved in some really uh, important protests in Madrid in the late 19th century, including one in 1885 when they were going to mechanize the the tabacalera. And the, the cigarreras rose up in, in protest because they thought they were all going to lose their jobs. So we have this really layered icon here. Yeah, definitely. Exactly. We, we have this sort of sensual and illusion on one hand. And on the other, this sort of icon that's associated with, with collective action and, and is often described as having this kind of this combative attitude. And this is the way that a lot of scholars have, have described it as the cigarrera as this, this combative image. So... Going back to the earlier question, this is a roundabout answer, but um, you know why the cigarera? Well, in part, it's kitsch. On the other hand, it's also this act of cultural recuperation. Right. That's using the cigarera to align struggles in Madrid today with this longer tradition of protest and working class politics. And interestingly, this is uh, a struggle that on one hand is taking place at the urban scale in Lavapiés, but is also part of a, a, a bigger and broader 
um, protest against policies that are changing the city and actually restructuring uh, Spain in general. Let's get back to your title. What is the CSA La Tabacalera? Okay, you sure. translate this into English as the Tobacco Factory of Lavapiés, and the letters CSA stand for, well, to translate them into English, Self-Managed Social Center. Tell us about this tobacco factory historically and socially. That is, it was located in the central neighborhood of Madrid called Lavapiés we've been referencing. What did it used to mean for the city? Well, originally, the Tabacalera was, was built in 1782 as this uh, royal production site for making uh, playing cards and, and liquor. Um, and later, it would be converted into one of several, a handful of them, several places around Spain where the crown could control the production of tobacco products. So it was for a long time one of the largest employers in Madrid, and also the building itself was one of the largest in the city. So it's, you know, it's this very long history as being in this iconic building if only visually, just because of the space it took up. But it's also very close to the city city center. It's about 15 minutes walking to the south of the uh, Puerto del Sol, which is Madrid's central square, kind of the Times Square of Madrid. With so many uh, workers working there, it, you know, is, is one of the factors that, that contributed to Lava Pies becoming one of the most important working class neighborhoods in the city. So in this way, the, the tabacalera, sort of like the cigarera, the building itself is a, is a symbol of another uh, age of economic production in Madrid. You know, and by the end of the 20th century, even though much of the production was mechanized, and in that sense it was even more industrial, it was nonetheless a space that was in technical terms still a place for, for Fordist production in the city. That is, um, you know, a site of, of, of industrial production. And what has it come to mean in more recent years? For example, it was closed in the early 2000s? So when the factory closed in 2002, there was a lot of debate about what to do with this large space. It's a huge building. I think it's about 32,000 square meters. In the midst of this debate, it's important to understand a couple of things about Lava Bies. First, it's important to know that since the 90s, it's been one of the bastions in the city for the Ocupa movement. And these ocupas or squatters are usually activists that occupy and squat abandoned buildings in order to turn them into uh, self-managed social spaces for art, community, community organizing, and other social uses. Yeah. And so these are not squatters of necessity, but rather these are people that are engaging in an act of civil disobedience. They are interested in reappropriating spaces in the city for the community. So part of the background of the Tabacalera has to do with these, these squatters because from 1997 to 2004, around there, there were these several iterations in different spaces, but always sort of the same community of imported uh, squatted social centers that was called El Laboratorio. So a lot of ways, the, the Tabacalera became a focal point as a new place for the Laboratorio to occupy, and they wanted to find a permanent space for this community in, in Lava Vieja. In the early 2000s, Lava Pies became this important site of targeted investment by both the municipal and the national government. And some of this could be seen in uh, infrastructure improvements, the rehabilitation of parks. Both government bodies, they saw Lava Pies as being an important part of the, the center district of Madrid that needed to be redeveloped, not only to bring Lava Pies into line with other changes happening in the city, but also as a way of sort of rebranding the city. It sounds like there was a convergence of both top-down redevelopment and some very intense grassroots activity happening there. Yeah, very much so. This, in the case of the Tabacalera, the Ministry of Culture swept in and bought the building, and they were intending to turn the space into this National Museum of Visual Arts and make it yet a, sort of another tourist site to complement the nearby Reina Sofia Museum and the Prado, which are located quite close to Lava Pies, actually. Quite close. You could say the corner of Lava Pies is, is the Reina Sofia Museum. Absolutely. And so in this broader context, the, the effort to turn the Tabacalera into, into a national museum and into a space for tourism, it was, it was part of this larger shift towards new modes of production in Madrid. The Tabacalera represents a, s a symbolic shift in the use of space in the city, in which the formerly industrial space is really kind of becoming this post fortis space dedicated to creating more symbolic value in the city and the neighborhood. And implicitly in all this, there is Madrid's role as a capital city, uh, which urban planning is 
capitalizing on, a location central in defining the Spanish state, in attracting visitors to consume a modern form of national culture. Exactly. And so it's important to keep all that in mind since the new museum was going to attract tourists as they sort of moved back and forth between the Reina Sofia and this new museum and another space called the Casa Encendida that was uh, funded by the uh, the cultural foundation apparatus of the, the Caja Madrid, one of the community savings and loans in Madrid. Um, but at the end, you know, overall, the vision of the planners and the institutions of, of investment that were driving a lot of this was they wanted to use this this museum to more fully integrate uh, Lava Pies into the cultural itinerary of the city. Yeah, yeah. And this would in turn make real estate prices rise in the neighborhood and attract investment bring tourists with their dollars, bring professionals into the city center to live and spend their money, but also, you know, real estate as an investment apparatus, which was a, a large part of the economic re restructuring that was in place that led up to the economic crisis when the um, construction and mortgage industries all collapsed and Spain still suffering from a lot of that. So in this context, we can really see uh, the Tabaglera as, as symbolic of this new mode of production that's, that's about culture, investment, and real estate. I'm thinking of Sharon Zukin's work on the cultures of cities, David Harvey's work on urbanized capital. The, right. There's the link between culture, uh, economy, and urbanization, which is in many ways still a blind spot for mainstream thinking about cities. Yeah. What, what I want to know is how did the Tabacalera go from being a key node in the city, a focal point for forces that wanted to, uh, to put it simply, to sell Madrid, ah, to yes. becoming a self-managed social center? I, this is quite a left turn. That's a really good question. How did it become you know, a self-managed social center? It was supposed to be this national museum, then it became this community center. When the bottom dropped out of the economy in 2008, the government didn't have the money to really carry out this intended museum project. So as a result, they ended up um, ceding part of the space to this collective made up of activists in the neighborhood. Some that were some of these ocupas from the old laboratorio. Some were new arrivals in the neighborhood. Other groups made up of foreign immigrants. So for example, there was a group that was called Afro Tabacalera that was made up of mainly sub-Saharan immigrants that lived in the neighborhood. So now the Ministry of Culture maintains this separate exhibition space in the building. And those are exhibitions that are organized within the official purview of the Ministry of Culture or what was formerly the Ministry of Culture. And so the government is paying to support these events, their costs, their infrastructures. As a result, they pay the lights, the gas, they provide security for the building, but but the majority of it, probably about 85% of the building, is managed by these neighborhood collectives. They have these huge spaces for concerts, there's a space for other kinds of theatrical experimentation and exploration. There's another space that's for uh, people that work in the plastic arts to basically as a workshop for them, uh, urban gardens, you know, and then there's also space where local community groups can, can meet. So the, the Tabagalera, the space is not only symbolic of these sort of new post fortis ways of producing a city, but it's also symbolic of these more cooperative approaches to using city space. So I understand that you traveled to Madrid for this research. Uh, there are some great images in your article of the building itself, its exterior, but also some of the performances that took place there. A, a single singer, another is of a group of performers. Yeah, I was I was uh, I was fortunate enough to to be awarded a Fulbright uh, research grant in 2011 and 2012, and had the opportunity to spend the year in Madrid, working on on a lot of this, um, working on this subject. You know, but unfortunately, those images that are in the article, they're they're actually not mine. They were graciously passed to me by David Rodriguez, who I interviewed while writing this article, who was involved in the performance that's discussed in the article. But I did have uh, an opportunity to explore some other uh, very interesting performances that were happening in the neighborhood, as well as some, some nearby sites where there's similar kinds of reappropriations of, uh, of urban space. And they, they're more examples of this kind of mutual cooperation that, that's kind of going on between neighborhood groups and governments. And you were able to see a play by Juan Mayorga. So, uh, you know, I did, I did see this one play by, by Juan Mayorga, who's this very important uh, contemporary dramatist in Madrid. And in this case, it was a play that was performed originally in the, in the Tabacalera. But when I encountered it, it was being staged in El Cuarto Pared, which is a uh, an independent theater space in Lava Pies and a very important independent theater. 
And what was interesting was that, that, that this performance really had seemed to maintain the aesthetic from the, the bagalera. So it's a brick wall that was unadorned, just a table. And they, they kept this very austere sort of aesthetic in their performance. And so as I saw it, it was sort of that the, the tabacalera not only helped to launch this particular performance, it gave them an, a, a space and an opportunity to develop their work, but it actually was influencing the aesthetic of the product that they were creating. Oh, that's cool. And so they actually went on to take this performance to a number of other locations in Spain. They won some awards, even went abroad with it. Yeah. And so it's, it's really quite remarkable to see how this self-managed community space uh, really became this site for the incubation of, of cultural production. And so this is clearly a very different model than the, the kind of theater that, that's happening at the National Drama Center that was built in Lava Pies and the Plaza Lava Pies inaugurated in 2006. So right in the middle of this this um, this effort to rehabilitate the neighborhood through cultural investment and the National Drama Center called the, the Teatro Bayinclan, you know, they usually produce much more international theater, Tennessee Williams, Chekhov, as well as more canonical Spanish work. But often it's not contemporary Spanish drama is being represented there. Juan Mayorga himself has gotten very involved in that that work and he's been a good vehicle for him, but I think in general, considering the number of artists, actors, directors, writers that are working in Lava Pies, it, it hasn't really been a vehicle that's connected to that, to the grassroots production of drama that's, that is actually occurring in the neighborhood. Now, you write in your article of, quote, efforts to acquire the empty space of La Tabacalera for the use of the community, uh -huh. of how these efforts intersect with or confront discourses of culture at different scales. That is, the center might mean one thing for the neighborhood community, the people living and or working in Lava Pies, and then it might mean something quite different for the municipal government or uh, the somewhat more national question of tourism and the urban perspective that sees in cities, in their buildings, in their spaces, the chance for profit making. On a theoretical level, that is one of the central questions that I was interested in, was about this interweaving of these different scales because I felt that the Tabacalera really sort of laid bare, you know, the ways in which the global and the local really folded into one another within these new modes of, of cultural production. So in the management of the building itself, you have the, the national government partly engaged in promoting itself through the investment at the urban scale. They're very much interested in this network of museums, but transforming urban space to, to support that and to increase the brand of Madrid and increase the brand of Spain through that cultural itinerary. And then likewise, you have all these neighborhood activists that are appropriating buildings, again, at the urban scale, that in this case is both a neighborhood symbol as well as a citywide symbol of the past. And then on top of all this, you know, there was the, is the interesting fact that the Tabacalera became a very important site for the organizers of the, the 15M or the 15M movement, also known as the Indignados mm -hmm. from May of 2011. It became very important to them for, for planning and storing materials um, both before and after the encampment. Because of its location, it became a natural site that actually in El País, they described the Tabacalera as the, the neurological center of the 15M movement. And you know, I think many people in La Papies and even in the 15M movement would, would probably disregard that that kind of description, I think that the perception is is significant. And even on a on a very um, uh, material level, the um, some of the participants that I spoke to, they they described how there's all these old shelves in the tabacalera from when they would used to stack these boxes of, of cigarettes, and a lot of those old shelves were were, were taken from the tabacalera and were actually um, incorporated into the physical structures in the encampment. And so the tabacaleras physical materials were actually incorporated in the Kinshami movement. Oh, that's a great detail to know. It, it is an interesting detail because it, this national movement even would later go on to inspire the Occupy movement in Wall Street. What do you think the next decade or so has in store for residents of the neighborhood of Lava Pies? What kind of battles are they going to be engaged in? How does the future look? Well, Lava Pies is a very different neighborhood than it was 15 years ago or 20 years ago or, or maybe even three or four years ago. The, the Calle Argumosa, which connects the Reina Sofia Museum with, with Lava Pies, has become very cool and the, the terraces are, you know, a place to see and be seen. Not, not in a 
some kind of a very fancy way, but for people that are kind of neo-Bohemian, uh, sort of in the way that, that Greenwich Village in, in Manhattan has that element of cool, but many people can't really afford to live in Greenwich Village anymore. Bars serving craft beer. There's this, the Boca del Lobo, that's this, both a bar and an art space. But across the, the um, Plaza Lavapiés at the other end of the street, a lot of that gentrification hasn't really penetrated that, that other side. You have these halal butcher, Senegalese restaurants, Latin American locutorios or, or phone and internet centers. And so it really remains to be seen whether these, this process of gentrification is really ever going to transform this neighborhood fully uh, in the ways that were envisioned by the municipal planners back in, in 1997 when they thought that, that these free market forces were going to raise the, the real estate prices and, as they describe it, change the social character of the neighborhood. It's an interesting phrase. So today, though, the city has learned to, to commodify this element of Lava Pies. And yep. so there's this Bali Madrid festival that, um, you know, when I was there in 2009, was just a few stands in the plaza. But in 2012, it had moved in front of the Escuelas Pias Library in a much bigger plaza. And in this sense, this, you know, the city is caught in this push-pull of, on one hand, wanting the neighborhood to be gentrified, but also very much cashing in on its multicultural street cred um, that it lends the city. And you know, it, it, is, it is the place in Lava Pies where both tourists and locals go to get curry, for example. And finally, uh, what, what about the question of theater in Lava Pies? Yeah, well, as far as theater goes, there's some interesting things that have, that have occurred. And there's a number of independent theaters in the, the neighborhood, and they've all banded together to form this theater cooperative. And, and if people join the cooperative, you get a discount on the prices. And they're really trying to form a unified front in this very hostile financial um, and economic climate. And so this, this includes um, Cuarto Pared, Sala Mirador, and also um, Jose Sanchez Sinisterra's, uh, he has his lab theater project in Lava Pies called the Nuevo Teatro Fronterizo. And um, all of these spaces have started to, to sort of try to work together as opposed to compete with one another. And then interestingly, you know, one of these theater spaces was the Sala Triangulo, and uh, it changed its name to the, the Teatro del Barrio. It's a place where they've tried to integrate themselves more fully with the neighborhood you know, for example, the, this new political party that's, that's making all kinds of waves in Spain, Podemos, well, Pablo Iglesias, who's the um, most visible candidate, he, he often holds meetings there. And so, you know, in the theater spaces of Lava Pies, there's always like all this activity and energy. Well, thanks for being here, Matt. All best for your next trip to Madrid, and congrats on the Fulbright. That's quite an honor. Thanks, Ben. I appreciate having the opportunity to discuss my work. It's, it's, been, it's been a pleasure. Matt Feinberg's article, From Figarreras to Indignado Spectacles of Scale in the CSA La Tabacadera of Lavapiés, Madrid, is published in the International Journal of Iberian Studies, Volume 26, Double Issue 1 and 2, 2013. Also, be sure to check out his recent article, Don Juan Tenorio in the Campo de Cebada, Restaging Urban Space After 15M, that was recently published in a special issue of the Journal of Spanish Cultural Studies entitled Occupy Spain, 15M and the Culture of Indignation. Remember that you can access the Journal of Urban Cultural Studies in both print and online formats through Intellect Publishers. And make sure to follow our multi-authored blog for more urban discussions at urbanculturalstudies.wordpress.com.